Well, shares in Credit Suisse and UBS have both plunged following an announcement the banking giant would take over its embattled Swiss rival. Joining me now for more on this, Evan Lucas, Chief Market Anal Analyst at InvestSmart. Evan, thanks very much for uh, your time today. Look, it's an interesting move. The hope is it shores things up, but it looks like some short-term pain. How would you sum up, I guess, just any risk of contagion at the moment from the failures you've, we've seen in the US and Europe? Yeah, morning, Tom. Look, the first phase, I sort of answer that. Just need to put it into context, particularly from the US side, how sort of slightly common it is to, to see scenarios like this. There's been, since 2000, 563 US banks go by the wayside. So it's not an uncommon thing. The difference between what's going on with UBS and Credit Suisse and also what happened last week with SV, also with Signature, now we're also looking at First Republic, as you said, is the contagion. The UBS Credit Suisse tie-up has actually been talked about for about 12 months since Credit Suisse's big issues around its, particularly its regulation, around the way that it was handling itself over things like issues in Mozambique, what was going on around drug funding, what was also going on around their overall credit funding for someone like, you know, for us here in Australia, Lex Greensill, the guy out of Queensland. All of that came to a head. So they had found themselves under pressure. You then have this scenario where their credit rating and their credit was being completely eroded. The clients that they had were starting to ask a lot of questions. They were withdrawing funds. And when you have a scenario where your balance sheet is being taken out by the creditors and your lending is not getting in any better, you start to see cracks. And that was why Credit Suisse had to be shored up. It's why you've seen the Swiss National Bank do this. And UBS, as I said, had been mooted to do this for about 12 months. There's no doubt regulators have been talking to them for a while. And finally, that's come to a head over the weekend. It's a massive haircut, as you said, Tom. On Friday, mm. compared to what Credit Suisse's price was to what it was on Monday, it's half. And that's why they created yesterday morning for us here in Australia around that price. And UBS saw a 14% decline because, again, they are taking on a very risky asset in a market that is also facing quite increased costs. Right. So going through that, Credit Suisse, basically, it's had its problems. This wasn't a, a shock, it's fair to say. Silicon Valley Bank mm -hmm. was an interesting one because that was all about way too much in government bonds and then what happened as a result when interest rates went up. What seems to be happening so far doesn't indicate we've got, you know, one type of bad investment or one type of issue that, that's shared across the system. Is this just a new environment where growth's difficult, inflation's difficult and so on? And... Um, it stress tests businesses and some will fall over rather than some sort of GFC again. Greater problem. So this is, the, so again, last night, you know, there was a big report come out from JP Morgan, which talked about the Minsky problem. And now the Minsky problem is a famous US economist who basically says that when you have this kind of level of risk in it, you get a short, sharp economic and financial sort of crisis. So Asian financial crisis is a Minsky problem. 2008 GFC is a Minsky problem. And he is now suggesting that maybe 2023 is there. Because as you said, you've got high inflation, you've got high funding costs, increasing interest rates that are likely to still come from the big central banks, the US Federal Reserve, the ECB, the European Central Bank is doing that as well. All of them are facing high costs. And therefore, the other thing about it is serviceability. So laws and regulations have been put in place since the GFC around risk and around serviceability has meant that if you're now offering a cash rate of 6%, serviceability buffers put into the private banks means you need to be probably uh, you know, evaluating risk at about 9%. So which business, which household, which person can realistically be affording that kind of level of serviceability? It seizes mm. up credit, it seizes up lending, it seizes up growth. And therefore, if a bank can't grow its loan book and can't grow itself, it has a massive problem from that side. And then if the creditors get wind that they're under pressure, they start withdrawing and it cracks on the other side. So that's the, the scenario we're in right now, probably, Tom. Is it GFC? It's different, but... It's another pressure that the financial system is having to absorb of higher costs, higher serviceability mm. and higher regulation from what we saw in 2008. And that's the concern right now. Right, yeah. It, it, not so much the systemic risk, but um, as you alluded to, difficult times. And uh, as well, I thought the interesting thing you noted there, Evan, is, is about different buffer rules. And the one I want to zero in on here is the refinancing rule. So... 
All these mortgage holders yep. in Australia are coming off fixed rates. 800000 this year, I think it's 500000 next year, 500000 last year. They mm -hmm. want to get new rates, but many of them can't. Is this a bit of a, a strange rule to have in place? Because I understand if you don't want to have risky loans in the economy. That's the whole point around the 3% buffer rule. You've got to make sure someone can pay off a home yep. loan, even if rates go up by 3%. If they've already got a home loan... Their, homes, their loan's already in the market. It's not so much of a risk. And you're just stopping them being able to shop around, even if they've still got a 1% or 2% buffer. Is this something you think could be looked at, um, given, you know, this is not actually going to increase risk in the economy, but it just stops people moving around? Yeah, it does. So the, re, the, the buffer rule that you alluded to there, that 3% buffer, Tom, came in in October 2021 when rates were obviously at record all-time lows. So we had the 0.1 mm. in the cash rate and you were getting home loan rates of between, you know, 1.5% to 2.5%. So under the APRA rules, which were brought in for that buffer rule, was that if rates were to rise, could you service a mortgage between 35 4.5%? Well, the cash rate's at 3.5%. In fact, it's at 3.6% which means the home loan rates now, standard variable mortgage rates are sitting at about six. But that rule from 2021 is still in place. So that's where that 9% serviceability is in. And it, therefore, you're right. It's what is referred to, it's part of the term mortgage prison. And mortgage prison, as mm. you're sort of alluding to there, is the idea that you have purchased a house, the equity in your house has fallen, therefore what we call your loan valuation ratio. So the amount of money you've borrowed, the equity that you have, needs to be normally about 80% loan, 20% equity to be outside of mortgage lenders insurance and the ability to do serviceability. But because we've seen house prices fall, that may now mean that your serviceability or your LVR has gone to 85, sort of 15, just sort of making those numbers on a hypothetical. You're therefore right. Your ability to move is much, much harder because you're seen as a riskier prospect the amount of repayments that you need to do for the rate will be higher. So therefore, you've got to put that buffer back into it. So it's no longer 9%, it may be now 9.5%. Can you service a loan that might be a quarter of a million dollars? Or in Sydney, where the average sort of number is around eight fifty dollars to $900,000. It's very mm. unlikely. So you are stuck. You cannot refinance. And that's what you're yeah. referring to. This is mortgage prison. It's what it's referred to. You can't shift. And therefore, you are on the hook for higher repayments in a scenario that you can't afford to do, therefore are you forced to sell or are you into a scenario where you go into a death loop and have to deal with the repayments and an equity position that actually ends up being negative? Yeah, and, and what's supposed to make the system safer might actually mean more defaults. It's actually made it worse. Evan, yeah, Evan, great to get your thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.